There's a lot of people in the world, and more of them than you realize are in tribes. But which tribes would you least like to encounter? Let's explore. These are the 20 scariest tribes you don't want to meet. Number 20. North Sentinelese Keep out! The Sentinelese are the most isolated people on the planet. They actively reject any contact with the outside world. Meet the forgotten tribe that has not yet discovered fire. They may have inhabited their island as a people for 55,000 years. Complete with isolation on a small island in the Indian Ocean means that the Sentinelese are violently protective of their territory and have killed anyone that's poked their nose into their business. It does sound harsh, but with their neighboring island's populations destroyed by disease that was imported from other places, any germ or virus that they might catch from an outsider would probably wipe them out. Obviously, it's tricky to understand anything much about a tribe that you can't get close to without receiving an arrow through the chest, so all that's known has been observed by a few nosy parkers on boats that are carefully moored further than any arrows reach off the coast of the island. In the 1880s, a British expedition landed on the island and discovered the villages and houses abandoned. Presumably, the tribe had seen the invading force and just hidden themselves. The expeditioners did come across an old couple and some children. In the hideous wisdom of the colonial attitude, the British would kidnap the people from the island for scientific reasons. The Sentinelese quickly became sick with disease, and the older people died. The children would be returned to the island, but how many were then infected with deadly diseases is obviously unknown. Now, it's no small wonder that the outsiders met with hostility by the Sentinelese. Various attempts at communication were made throughout the 1970s and 80s, with gifts being left on the beaches, but most were rejected and then buried by the tribe. More recently, it's finally been accepted that it's probably the safest for the Sentinelese tribe if they're just left in peace. I guess the nosy Parkers have finally gotten the message. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. The Igbo Tribe the Igbo, or Ibo people, live in the southeastern of Nigeria. It's the language of Igbo that unites these groups of people who have other cultural divisions within their tribes. It was only after European colonization that the Igbo people were grouped together as one tribe. Prior to that, they lived as separate autonomous communities. The Igbo people are substance farmers, growing crops which include yams, cassava, corn, melons, okra, and beans, and the land on which the crops are farmed is owned communally, and they produce palm oil for export. Amongst the Igbo people, there is a very high literacy rate, and many people in the community are civil servants and entrepreneurs. In fact, many of the women hold significant roles in both trade and local government. So far, not so scary. But what exactly do you expect in the modern global world? It's probably time to pack up all the rubbish old stereotypes and get over this nonsense notion of groups of people being inherently scary, especially when that fear is just based on a lack of knowledge or, more often, willful ignorance. Number 18. Korowai Tribe this Indonesian tribe is actually famous. Despite being pretty isolated and living harmoniously with nature in their rainforest home, the Korowai people have hit the headlines all over the place with tabloids looking for sensational stories of wild places and weird rituals. The newspaper's dreams came true when they could point a spotlight on the unusual culture of the Korowai people, listing cannibalism and witchcraft amongst their favorite hobbies. But as is always the case with the tabloid headlines, you do have to look a little deeper to get a real sense of what the story might be. In a remote area of the Indonesian rainforest, the Korowai build their remarkable homes between 8 and 15 meters off the ground, sometimes in the trees or on tall stilts. The reason is said to be that evil spirits only stay on the ground.
so building up high keeps the family safe. It also offers great protection from animals and many insects, as well as invading humans. They are a religious people, with their beliefs including reincarnation as well as respect for their ancestors, and a belief that some of their people have magical abilities, they're able to influence luck and detect black magic. Now, this element of their culture is most probably where the accusations of cannibalism and witchcraft come from, and in the past, there may have been some violent ends to disagreements within the tribe. These days, however, most issues are pretty much solved by giving each other gifts. I guess that offering a bunch of flowers to your neighbor is a little less dramatic than eating them, but probably makes a lot less mess. Not so good for tabloid headlines, though. Number 17. Surrey People the Suri, or Surma people of Ethiopia, have a unique style of fighting known as stick fighting. The two fighters, with bodies decorated in chalk mixed with water, are armed with a six-foot wooden pole. It's pretty hefty and weighs a couple of pounds. The long pole is held at the bottom, and the aim of the sport is to whack your opponent with your massive stick as many times as possible in order to get him to fall down. When your opponent then hits the deck, they're eliminated. The prize at the end of the tournament is an unusual one. The winner is carried on a platform to a group of girls, and then gets to pick which one he's going to marry. So, young men are selected for their stick fighting skills, and the young women, well, the size of their lip plates. The lower lip is pierced and then slowly stretched over the course of a year, using bigger and bigger discs. Ouch! The family of a woman with a big lip plate can ask for a price of as much as 50 cattle for her to be married. I like big plates, and I cannot lie. Number 16. Yanomami Tribe the Yanomami people live in the remote region of forests in southern Venezuela in the Orinoco River Basin and in the northeasternmost area of the Amazon River Basin in the very north of Brazil. These people live in small villages which are subject to moving when they need to inhabit a new area for the purposes of agriculture. The Yanomami practice a kind of shifting cultivation, which is known as slash and burn agriculture which is exactly as it sounds. They burn areas of the forest to clear space in order to plant crops. This makes more sense than you may think, as the ash provides some fertilization for the ground and weeds are more or less completely removed from the area. This is a technique that's practiced by many indigenous peoples, and after the land has been used for growing the crops, it's then left fallow and will revert to a secondary area of forest. Although it does sound brutal, this practice has taken place for thousands of years and does not impact the environment like the use of modern pesticides and such in industrial farming. As well as substance farming, the Yanomami also hunt deer, monkeys, armadillos, and some birds along with a few other things. And what may give this tribe the reputation as being scary is the ongoing hostility between these people and other local villages. They're constantly at war with one another, and this can be a pretty violent state of affairs. However, if you're not a hostile neighboring village, then you probably don't have a whole lot to worry about from the Yanomami people. Number 15. The Deslala Corubo People one of the groups of indigenous people of Brazil, the Deslala, as they call themselves, are known by outsiders as some of the most isolated people in the world. This tribe is very small, with only about 150 people, and when you think of Amazonian tribes, you probably imagine those old movie depictions, sorts of adventure stories and retro comics and books as being what you might have in your head. You know, the poison darts and great jungle hunting skills, well, those are actually not too far from the truth when it comes to this tribe. They're also known as something that I can't pronounce because it's a Portuguese word, but the word does mean clubbers. Not the partying kind, but the weapon-wielding kind. So this probably has a whole lot to do with their reputation for violence. Nicknames do stick, you know. Although, to be honest, it seems that the violence is just as likely to be done to the tribe's people by outsiders rather than the other way around. But it is true that they do hunt with poison darts and fight with clubs, so I guess if you need to imagine an Indiana Jones sort of scenario, go right ahead. Jock, start the engine. Number 14. Mashkopiro 
The Mashkopiro are also known as Nomali, and they're an indigenous tribe from the most remote areas of the Amazon rainforest in Peru. This nomadic people are hunter-gatherers who have actively avoided contact with non-native peoples, and it's no wonder that this is how they would choose to live, given that tribal people, who have been infiltrated by outsiders in other places, have generally brought upon disease, alcoholism, and violence to the indigenous populations of South America. This tribe do have a reputation for being very secretive and tend to shy away from being seen, but occasionally they've been photographed or at least spotted by nosy parkers out looking to poke about in the tribal people's business. This doesn't always end well. There were reports back in 2012 that after photographs were captured of the tribe, a member of the exploration team was then found dead with an arrow to the heart, allegedly poked there by the tribe themselves. Number 13. The Ao Rio Tribe The Ao Rio people live in an area known as the Gran Chaco, which spans both Paraguay and Bolivia. These people were traditionally nomadic hunter-gatherers, but it was mostly squeezed out of their lives by missionaries in the 20th century, so now the remaining tribes people are more or less sedentary in villages. Although a few remain who were not contacted, and they're now at risk from large-scale deforestation and loss of territory in the area. These days, there are laws in place to protect indigenous people from contact with outsiders. These are supposed to help prevent the transmission of diseases to the tribes, as they don't have the resistance to the diseases of the outside world. Oh, and many illnesses do prove devastating to these communities if they're infected. That's probably one of the most scary things, really, that they're put at such risk from dopey people poking about in their business. There are, of course, plenty of stories about the practices of remote tribes, but much of this is based on hearsay and gossip. So if you want all of that, then go look it up. Otherwise, we're just all guilty of spreading untruths for the sake of being sensationalistic, and frankly, that's ignorant. Number 12. The Asoro Mudmen these fearsome-looking masks are not something that you'd want to meet in the dark. The Asoro mudmen of Papua New Guinea are an ancient people. The Asora are also known as the Halosa, which means ghosts. They have no written history, but lots of stories and spoken word histories have been passed down throughout the generations. One of the stories goes that there was a wedding, and the tribe all wore their best costumes for the ceremony. However, one man did not have the clothing, and so as the tale goes, he took a string bag, cut out the eye holes, and then dipped the bag and his body in mud. He then arrived at the wedding dressed in this wild-looking costume, where the other people took one look at him and ran away, fearing that he was a ghost. And I can see why they were frightened. These masks can be super creepy. The story then goes that the incident gave the tribe's people the idea of making scary masks and using mud as body paint in order to make themselves look more intimidating, even terrifying in fact, to their enemies. The costume's not supposed to start a fight, but actually to put the enemy off. So although you might be terrified to meet a masked mud man, you're supposed to actually run away from him. Number 11. The Huli Wigman the Huli Wigmen of Papua New Guinea are extremely hair conscious. Their dress, both daily and ceremonially, revolves around their extraordinary wigs. The styles and variety of wigs that they create would not be out of place at Fashion Week. When combined with these fancy traditional dress and bright yellow painted faces of the Huli Wigmen, it's pretty unusual to say the least. There's actually a ritual and tradition involved in the growing of their hair to make the wigs and in the process of creating the remarkable headpieces themselves. Adolescent boys grow their hair for around 18 months at a time before it's carefully cut and then used to make the artistic hair pieces. The young men may go through this process many times over in order to grow the hair for the great ceremonial wigs. There's also money to be made from growing and selling their hair to the hairdo-loving elder tribesmen. The hair is then stitched into a wooden frame, shaped into elaborate designs, and then decorated with dyes and feathers. The resulting headpieces are really quite spectacular. So so calling them wigs really doesn't do them any justice. Number 10. Crocodile Men of Sepik Region 
In the eastern part of Papua New Guinea, there are some of the most remote and isolated villages. People who live here have a very little amount of contact with the outside world, and many of them continue to uphold ancient traditions and rituals. In Parambe village along the banks of the Sepik River in northern Papua New Guinea, there's a so-called house tambaran, or spirit houses. These are gathering points for the local belief system which reveres the manifestation of spirits as animals. These spirit houses are decorated with carvings and murals of many different sorts of creatures, from snakes to pigs, birds to crocodiles, and more. And it's these crocodiles that hold the most power in this animist religion. Initiation into the sepik involves the men, well, actually, they have this done when they're still boys, having their shoulders, upper backs, and torsos sliced up with razor blades. This leaves long welts that will heal to appear like a crocodile skin, a symbol of power. It's quite an ordeal, and some of the boys will actually pass out during the very painful process, which can take several hours to complete. After the cutting, the boys then may spend months learning life skills at the spirit house. Number 9. Chimbu Skeleton Tribe the name itself does sound a little bit scary, that's true enough. Anything with skeletons in the name is a bit of a concern. But as we've already learned, the names of many indigenous people are often forced on them by outsiders, and frequently these names are misguided or even just really flipping rude. So we need to do a bit more digging. The traditions of this tribe remain mostly unknown in outside circles, and since they were first encountered by Westerners in 1934, which was quickly followed by the introduction of Christian missions and coffee plantations, much of the tribe's history and culture has been eroded. The Chimbu tribe of Papua New Guinea use incredible black and white body paint in order to costume themselves and dance to make themselves appear like skeletons. Originally, this was just part of the way that the Chimbu psychologically intimidated their enemies and may also have been a way for the people to try and harness a supernatural force. It's spooky. The mystery behind these remarkable designs and their uses has definitely made the Chimbu a source of fascination to the outside. Perhaps that's why these traditional rituals are now only seen as part of celebrations that are gawped at by visitors. Number 8. Batak Tribe the Batak people are one of the largest indigenous tribes of Indonesia. They live in the highlands of the North Sumatran Islands, where they're still steeped in the ancient traditions of their people. The Batak represent approximately 3% of the population of Indonesia, and they're actually made up of many different ethnic groups that form the collective Batak people. They speak several differing languages, which are distinct, but fall into the same classification of Austronesian language family. The clans of Batak people have a history of patriarchal tradition, and so their tribe is still arranged in this way today, with the father and son relationship being strongly emphasized. There's basically nothing that's really scary or especially unusual about this group of people, although in the past there were suggestions that cannibalism may have been practiced. But frankly, the only people saying this were the missionaries hundreds of years ago, and they were apt to say this about almost everybody that they ever encountered. So make out of that what you will. Number 7. Akunsu Tribe the last time that anyone checked, there were only about six surviving members of the Akunsu people in the rainforests of Brazil, but there's almost no information about these people anywhere, so who can really say exactly how many of them exist or, indeed, anything much else about them at all? There are a few brief mentions of this tribe from an old book that contained information that had only been passed down secondhand and had not actually been witnessed by its author. He wrote of tales of a terrible and dangerous tribe that lived in the forests, frightening other peoples in the area so much that they never ventured near their territory. Oh, oh, oh. 
possible. But that was about all that was written down. So much like everything else, the mystery was sufficient to plan all kinds of ideas in people's heads about the dangerous nature of the tribe. In more recent times, there have been contacts with the outside world that have shown the Akunsu people to be a shamanic tribe with many beliefs and rituals that dominate their daily lives and interactions. However, these rituals are not exactly scary. In fact, they seem to stem from a fear within the Akunsu themselves. Rather than being designed to frighten anyone else, they're actually about protection. But like many indigenous peoples, the Akunsu have been pushed out of existence by the constant deforestation of the region. Number 6. Masa Tribe the Masa people traditionally live in territory that stretches across northern Tanzania and southern Kenya. They're a semi-nomadic indigenous tribe for whom the land is a most important and sacred part of their lives. There are many different communities within the Maasai peoples, and much of their tribal land lies within the bounds of gaming reserves in these parts of Africa. So many of them are actually involved in running the park, either as guides or other members of staff. Visits to Maasai villages are often included in many safari packages, so there's a preservation of tradition in that kind of staged way to demonstrate to tourists. Aside from that aspect of life being on show, these people continue to maintain many of their traditional ways of life. In Maasai culture, the belief is that the Maasai people are the custodians of cattle. Cows are used as a signifier of wealth. Grazing and trading herds of cows, and sometimes goats as well, is the primary source of income for the tribe. As a result, the land which the Maasai use is essential to their traditions, and that means of their existence as well. So land management is very important. They have an approach which respects and protects the land, and this is mainly achieved through a seasonal migration which allows the earth to recover as they move from one area to another. So basically, not scary at all, unless of course you have a fear of caring for the earth and of grazing cattle. Number 5. Agori Depicted as crazed and cannibalistic, the Aghoris are a small group of extremely devout Hindus who have taken this devotion to the max. On the banks of the river Ganges is the vibrant and extremely holy city of Varanasi, where Hindus travel to die. It does sound strange, but the Ganges is a significant place. The river is believed to be the god Ganja, so being able to die in Varanasi and be cremated on the banks of the Ganges is a most devoted way to be close to the gods when you leave this world for the next one. These people perform their rituals in the area around the river where cremations are carried out and dead bodies are pushed into the water. The deeply religious people believe that everything was created by the gods and is therefore beautiful. To them, this also means that nothing is low or base enough to not be considered beautiful. This even includes eating human flesh or even poo and rubbing their bodies in the cremated ashes of the dead. They perform these sacred rituals as a way to be closer to their god Shiva. Number 4. Mokan Tribe the Mokan tribe can be found all across a group of about 800 islands, which are both in Myanmar and Thailand. These people are semi-nomadic hunter-gatherers with lives that revolve around the sea. Obviously, like all of the world's natural resources, the seas are under threat from pollution and overfishing, and this means that the Mokan people's traditional way of life is also under pressure. These remarkable people have such an affinity with the sea that they've developed an incredible ability to see under water in a way which is much more effective than for most other people. Human vision is generally pretty blurry underwater, but a study which examined the underwater sight of Mokan children compared to European children actually showed that for the Mokan, their eyesight beneath the water was twice as good as any other child who was tested. What the study then went on to prove was that the European children could then be trained in order to improve their own underwater vision by using as frequently as the Mokan children children themselves. Number 3. Cargo Cult 
Worshipping an American soldier from World War II may not seem like the likeliest beginning point for a religion, but that seems to be how it went for the John Frum movement on the South Pacific island of Tana. Cargo cults are religious groups that believe that by performing ritual worship, a technologically advanced culture will bring plentiful goods, or cargo, to the worshippers. In 1941, the U.S. Army stationed a huge load of troops and all of their supplies that go along with an army in Tana. The people then were very poor, and it's understood that upon seeing the extraordinary amount of stuff, being the cargo, that the American GIs had brought to the island during the Second World War, the followers of the cargo cult of Tana believed that the gods were actually delivering them goods. The story goes that an American who introduced himself to the local people saying, I'm John from America, is where the John from movement came in a religion created in a miscommunication, perhaps. John Frum Day is celebrated on February 15th every year, where they fly American flags, worshippers paint USA onto their chests, and they use wooden guns in order to perform a kind of army-style drill dance. Another key part of the celebration is the creation of a landing strip with the hopes that it'll coax a return of John Frum and his cargo. How mind-blowing. Number 2. Zigwa Tribe in Tanzania One part of the Zigwa Tribe from Tanzania are known for their unusual and impressive traditions which involve snakes. The snake dancers are a group of native people who, well, dance with snakes, obviously. If you have a fear of snakes, then this may of course be an inherently scary concept for you, but if not, then it's simply just another aspect of a different culture which is probably not terribly scary if you look too closely. The men in this tribe have developed some special skills in snake handling, using snakes for medicine, and are also especially talented in doing a variety of so-called stunts with the reptiles. They do perform ceremonial dances with these animals, even with the most dangerous of all snakes being the black mamba. The general idea is that these people have become so acquainted with the snakes that they're actually able to live harmoniously together without the fear that's usually associated with the creatures. But what do you think? Do you fancy dancing with a snake? Or any other deadly creature for that matter? How about ballet with a bear or doing the conga with a crocodile? Is this a good way to improve interspecies relationships? Number 1. Torajan People In Indonesia, the Torajan people live with death amongst them, and not in any metaphorical sense either. They live with their dead relatives inside of their homes. That's exactly what it sounds like. Where many cultures around the world would bury or even cremate their dead within a few days of the death, the Torijin people of Indonesia take their dead home and live with their remains, sometimes for many years. When they do eventually bury them, they're regularly exhumed for cleaning and to be cared for. Now, this is quite an unusual practice, but the Torijin believe that death is part of the spiritual journey. So living amongst the mummified remains of your relatives, well, that's just an everyday part of life. They spend time with the corpses and even invite them to lunch on a daily basis as part of their tradition. Well, it does take all sorts now, doesn't it? Wow, what a crazy world it is out there. Makes me want to go and look at some of it. So, were these tribes what you had expected them to be? Were they so scary after all? Be sure to let me know in the comments below. Also, check out the other cool stuff showing up on the screen, and I'll see you next time.